Hang on a second, I have to get organized. Now I realize we're off the okay, there's another half of the show. <laughs> Boy, have this off for so long. <laughs> yeah. Uh, for John to get organized, we'll be back next month. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just be piped down, will you? It's a tough crowd, John. I'm I know, I've noticed that. I have noticed that. Okay. Um, one of the things that I've done in the last few years is um, travel a bit. I've been to about 30 countries. Um, how I, by the way, I might mention to you, you're past traveling to 30 countries, because as you get older, you find you slow up, and I've noticed lately I've been slowing up quite a bit. Um, one of the interesting things I've noticed in traveling is that uh, it's a bit of an exhausting experience. So I found out that one of the easiest ways to do traveling is actually to go online and go to a site called Google Earth. And you can go to just about anywhere in the world where people have tramped and taken photographs. And what I have actually done is taken these photographs uh, off the television, uh, off the computer, and put them together in an assembled uh, story. Now, the bias of this story is going to be uh, very English in as much as um, the British, as you know, had a great set of colonies, uh, including India and South Africa and Canada and whatever. In the process, uh, we finally got rid of the big pieces. But unfortunately, we've all been left with these little pieces on these islands, which unfortunately are still part of the British Empire, so to speak. Um, for instance, um, one particular island that I'm going to talk about um, ended up having a volcano on it, and uh, they had to take all the people off that island in the South Atlantic and ship them to the United Kingdom for two years. Once the uh, volcano collapsed, then finally they were able to return. But the, the, all of this is cost, and that's what the British Empire is now costing the British people. So I'm going to be talking about these kinds of issues. Uh, and there is, a, needless to say, a certain British bias to it, because that's where I come from. So uh, let's begin the story, shall we? Okay. The first place I'm going to visit here is, um, what happened then? Disappeared all of a sudden. Okay, I bumped it. Right. Very good. Good point. Very sensitive soul, you know, this computer. Okay, I'm going to go to this first place, which really has nothing to do with Britain, but essentially it's Iceland, and Iceland is an interesting place. It's hard to realize that it's only probably about 65 million years old. What happened was a meteorite, we believe, hit the middle of the Atlantic and European plate. There was an enormous volcano, and that essentially established the island of Iceland. And you can actually see in the center of Iceland evidence of where the Atlantic and Pacific plates meet. And I'm going to show you that. I've actually been to Iceland. It's very, very pleasant. Um, here is the first shot. When you get off the airport, this is the kind of thing you see. You're driving down the road. That's what you see. It's a lava field, and it extends an enormous area. You can see uh, there's a little hill here. Uh, but this, is, um, this goes on for about 20 miles before you reach the town of Reykjavik. So Iceland is, as I say, large sections of it are volcanic uh, and still covered in it, with no moss or any degrading of the, uh, of the volcanic ash. Okay, let's move along here. This is a, a shot closer to this here. As you notice, this area is a, a geothermal plant where people where they actually take steam out of the ground and make uh, hydroelectricity uh, electricity <coughs> um, and uh, interesting enough in this particular area south of this there was a bunch of kids who were driving one day or oh, um, hiking I guess one day <coughs> through the lava field and they discovered this hot spring that was really really nice and so the word got out amongst the teenagers, and they were all jumping in and out of this around the 1950s, thinking this was the greatest thing since sliced bread. Somebody must have heard about it and decided they were going to capitalize on it. And so they put now a 
back there, uh, and you can actually go to this particular place. And there are, these are the sort of vents, this concrete block is where the water vents in. It comes in at about, mm, about 100 degrees, maybe 150 degrees, the water. And if you stand there, you'll get scorched. Um, and I did. <laughs> I challenged somewhat, boy, I got close, and then I said, I, I gotta leave there. One of the interesting things is the prevailing temperature, even in the evening, for instance, in Iceland is around 45. Now, the water here is around 95. There's nothing quite like jumping in and out of this water, and then finally, when you finally have to leave, go in and then find, oh my God, it's cold in here. <laughs> It's really rather unpleasant. So Iceland, uh, that part of Iceland was really kind of intriguing. Uh, it's called the Blue Lagoon, for obvious reasons. Okay, this is a shot showing again the ice, the lava field. I think it's a rather uh, magnificent. You can see it's the same hill that we were looking at, but here there's clearly a water course through there. Okay, and this, uh, now we're moving on to another part of Iceland, which is somewhat to the west of this area, and this is the area where I was talking about, where the Atlantic and the European plates are. This is one part of it, that's, I suspect, the uh, Atlantic plate, which is towards the United States, and this is the European plate. I'm going to show you more shots of that. There it is. Um, again great schism where these rocks had moved past each other. And again, somewhat the same shot. Now, one of the interesting things too is that there's glaciers in Iceland, of course, in the eastern part, and in the springtime there's this sudden melting and this huge quantity of water is gushing through the rivers and the like. And I've actually been in one area like this, looking down, and it's frightening because if anyone ever slipped and fell in, it'd be instant death because the it's absolutely cold as, as anything. But it's quite, as you see, vis visibly rather exciting. I found Iceland a most intriguing place to look at. The weather isn't exactly warm and fuzzy, but, but nevertheless, it's, it's kind of pleasant. The, 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 um, the la landscape is somewhat similar to northern Scotland, and of course that's comparable to the latitude. Now this is a, 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 the geyser, a geyser. Um, the geyser, uh, uh, one of the geysers, and the original geyser is just called geyser. So the word geyser, which we use for all these erupting water spouts, um, come from Iceland. So when you say, hey, look, look at the geyser, you're speaking Icelandic. Congratulations. <laughs> okay. Uh, again, uh, same shot, uh, somewhat different time of year. Uh, you get some very picturesque colors as you walk through the landscape. Uh, again, evidence of volcanoes. Uh, this one clearly is kind of not active anymore. And this, you get some shots of rather beautiful um, vegetation at, at different times of the year. This is probably in the fall. Okay, we'll move on to the next one if I can, if I can get myself organized. All right. Next I'm going to talk about some warm islands. Um, this one is a place in Haiti. This is a, an enormous fortification built in 1810 by a Christophe. Christophe was one of the first um, black emperors, we might say, of the island. And he, uh, he took 20,000 slaves. Interesting enough that the, the slave rebellion in, in, in Haiti uh, started in about 1793 and um, was snuffed out, uh, attempted to be snuffed out by the British and Napoleon in 1801, 1802. Uh, failed miserably on both counts. Um, one of the uh, great early leaders of the Haiti Rebellion 
pushed back the British back to Jamaica. And the French sent 30,000 troops originally to Haiti, attempting to um, put back all of the people back into slavery and weren't very successful in the process. Um, and uh, it, it was interesting because of the 30,000 troops that were sent, the original idea, I think, by Napoleon was, one, to establish the, the island back to what its great productivity was for the French. It's, it's hard to realize that Haiti produced more wealth for the French than all of the wealth generated by the United States at that time. Mm -hmm. It was a great, incredible source of income. But it was all based, of course, on slavery. No costs for production. At any rate, the, uh, the upshot of this was uh, they finally got so frosted off with this whole business that they, they rebelled and kicked them out. But the Napoleon's idea was to start with these 30,000 troops, su suppress all of the native population, failed miserably because of disease. Napoleon was down to 3,000 troops at the end, and they finally gave up. In the process, interestingly enough, Napoleon realized that sending all these crack troops that he had had out into the tropics was not such a smart idea. At the time, Jefferson, by the way, was trying to buy New Orleans. And so uh, Napoleon decided, why not take all of it? And that was how America expanded its uh, land mass from the British zones on the east to the central part of the United States, which at that time was supposedly owned by France, hence the Louisiana Purchase. Okay. John, what was the product that Haiti was, oh, that, well, that agricul was making France so wealthy? Oh, agricultural stuff like um, uh, bananas and all these kinds of foods that uh, that they that they had. Coconuts. So, you know, uh, it was all agricultural product. Yes. Uh, this is just another shot of it. So it's an amazing piece of architecture. Twenty thousand uh, slaves built that. And it took them three years. Okay, that was a little bit of Haiti, a little bit of history of Haiti. This is the Azores, showing you what a volcano looks like. You've seen a volcano in Iceland, what it looks like. This is a volcano in the Azores, showing you that the vegetation does repair the land somewhat in the process. Um, again, I, I, I haven't researched the Azores particularly well, but I did think this was a rather magnificent shot. Okay, um, now comes part of the British piece. This is uh, the island I was talking about that actually exploded in 1961, um, and uh, they had to take all the people off the island. This is called Tristan de Cunha, and it's in the southern part of the Atlantic, somewhat uh, east of the Falkland Islands, between essentially South America, Argentina, and um, South Africa, almost slap bang in the middle. Not too far south because it isn't that cold. Um, and it's a, this is a shot that I took off um, Google Earth and you can play with it so that you can get exactly the right shape and size and whatever. So it's a rather, I think, a beautiful shot of the island. Okay, here is the side of the island showing you what it looks like. Um, rather remote. And this is the this is uh, the town of Edinburgh by the sea. It's called um, uh, because at one point the Prince Consort from Victoria uh, of Victoria came and visited. He was known as the Duke of Edinburgh, like our Duke of Edinburgh, and they called the, the town after him. This is, as they say, Edinburgh by the sea, somewhat different from Edinburgh the proper. Um, it's interesting too that. Somebody actually visited the, the, uh, these people not long ago to try and interact with them. He was a, a, a journalist, and he wanted to go along and, and chat with the people and see how it was like. Well, he went and landed on the island to find that nobody wanted to talk to him. He stayed there four months attempting to communicate with them. They would not talk to him. He was a stranger. So it just shows you 
how alienated they were from the rest of the world. And God knows what they were, must have been like going to visit Britain for two years. They must have been isolated in some kind of little camp and kept away from the, the natives because I don't think they wanted to deal with them. Okay, moving along here. This is another island. This, t this time we've moved into uh, an island I've not been to. It's called Socotra. It's uh, in, uh, just off Somalia and south of um, Yemen, and both countries claim it. <coughs> the reason why I kind of show it is because the vegetation is, is quite weird. It looks like it's arid as all hell, but then there are these trees growing in the middle of it, which is amazing. So the eastern part of the island has some water. The western part of the island is almost desert. And this is another shot showing the kinds of plants that are on this island, unique plants in as much as there are no plants like it anywhere else in the world. And these are these, showing the trees and these funny little turnip type things. Really odd places. And as I say, this is me wandering around the world looking for odd places to look at. I just find it fascinating to see what different things there are, and hopefully without too many people in them. Gee. <laughs> Okay, next we're going to move to somewhere where there, there are people in there. Uh, this is Gibraltar. Uh, this is again a Google Earth shot. Uh, this huge piece of uh, rock in the middle here, you can see, is the Great Massive. Um, in the World War II, they actually took all of the people off this promontory and sent them to Jamaica because they, the British wanted to have this as a total fort. So it is a military base. The, the back end here is the military base. I've been to Gibraltar. There, by the way, that little patch there is the cricket field. I haven't seen it. Um, it's, if you notice, it's not green. It's sandy. But it was funny to watch the guys playing uh, uh, cricket on, on this sandy patch. Um, in World War II, they drilled essentially a huge labyrinth of tunnels and whatever so that he, if it was attacked, they would be able to defend it quite strongly. It's been very contentious, this, uh, this promontory. The Spanish held it until 1704. And then, all of a sudden, I don't know if you're familiar with it, they, there was a, a rather unpleasant period in the 17, early 1700s when the, uh, the Dutch colony, the, uh, Holland, was part of Spain, believe it or not, for reasons of marriage and whatever. I don't want to get into the details. But in the process, the Dutch wanted to throw off the yoke of the Spanish. So they decided, with the help of Britain, who was obviously interested in this piece of rock, uh, decided the Dutch and British Marines would throw out the Spanish. And they did. And they threw them out in 1704. And then finally, all these wars and whatever were going on in this time, finally in 1713, a settlement was made between Spain and Britain and all these other contentious countries. And in the process, there was a Treaty of Utrecht, which was in 1713, and the British were given Gibraltar in perpetuity. So this means that, hey, provided the residents want to stay British, they can. And in the process, interestingly enough, they had a referendum in 1995, and the vote was 998 99.8% percent wanted to stay British, 1.2 wanted to stay Spanish. So there's an airport here. Um, when you go into Gibraltar, uh, you find a lot of characters uh, trying to sell you something, uh, and they're a pretty shady group of people. But this place is an extremely interesting place. Moving along, this is the shot of the rock. Um, in it are some apes and some all kinds of interesting artifacts. Uh, this, by the way, is, a, 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 on the other side of this, is a huge concrete surface to drain any water, get water into this um, island. There isn't enough fresh water coming in, so the British have to actually import, or the Gibraltans have to import, water from Morocco across the way. Okay, moving along here. This is a, shows you uh, the center <coughs> of Gibraltar. And notice the sort of British architecture, but notice the sunshine. British architecture always is usually in fog in Britain. Okay, um, now this is an interesting piece. 
Uh, here are the Spanish moaning and groaning about Gibraltar and how they need it and whatever. But interesting enough, across the way is another island, another promontory called Quinta. And Quinta is Spanish, believe it or not. And there is a border through here, believe it or not, that is a fence. This is part of the European Union. And the Moroccans are trying desperately to try and get in there so that they can become part of the European Union and then get themselves into Europe. And so the Spanish had to uh, keep this area around this <coughs> fence strongly patrolled. So Cuenta, historically, has been part of Spain for a long, long time. Originally part of the Romans and the Carthaginians and whatever. And the Moroccans and the Berbers, for instance, only held this area for a very short time. So in reality, Cuenta is legitimately semi-Spanish, as you might say. So here is the complaining about Gibraltar. The Moroccans are complaining about Cuenta. Interesting stuff, huh? At any rate, moving along this, Cuenta, rather similar to Gibraltar, except that the hill is a little shorter and lower, but the same kind of thing. Next, I'm going to take you to an island called St. Helena. Anybody know what's famous about St. Helena? That's where they took Napoleon. That's right. This is where Napoleon lived. Now, Napoleon in 1812, by the way, not the War of 1812 in the United States, but 1812 was finally decided they put him away around 1809, I think it was, and then he finally woke up and escaped Elba. So the British, having learned that, said, no way, that's not happening. So they sent him to this island which is off the African coast called St. Helena. Now, <clears throat> it's interesting. Uh, the British were concerned how that the French and their fleet might try and encourage him to come home again. So the British sur surrounded St. Helena with, with um, uh, uh, ships to, to prevent the French coming. But also, Tristan de Cunha is somewhat just south of St. Helena. Well, not just south, about a thousand kilometers, but, but nevertheless, they were concerned that the French might attempt to uh, colonize Tristan de Cunha so that they could essentially bring their troops in to free Napoleon. So in 1816, Britain essentially colonized Tristan de Cunha. The first settler, by the way, in Tristan de Cunha was <laughs> a, a person from Salem, Massachusetts. And in 1800, and, uh, I think it was 1810, he called it a Refreshment Island. But at any rate, the British took it over in 1816. Why? Because they wanted to make sure that the French weren't going to be able to get Napoleon off the island. So you see how all these things interact. Okay, and here is where Napoleon is buried. Um, there's some debate as to how he died, um, but probably they, they suspect arsenic poisoning was part of the story, but not the total story. Okay, moving on. This is another island. Um, this is Robinson Crusoe. Anybody know where Robinson Crusoe Island is? Well, it's just... It, west of Chile, about probably 500 miles out in the Pacific. And um, I thought it was a kind of an interesting place to look. The story of it was at one point when the, when the uh, Spanish did come, they brought in hogs and the hogs went wild and reproduced tremendously and it was a rather hostile place for a while until they shot them up and got rid of them. Um, again, another shot of the same thing, but here's the island giving you a sense of what the vegetation is like. Okay, moving along, uh, that's enough of that. We've looked at warm islands, we're gonna move on to the next one. This one, unfortunately, is gonna be cold islands. Okay, first one. This is Iona of Scotland. It's rather cool, uh, I've been there. Um, Iona was one of the, when, when the um, Norsemen came in and the Vikings came in on the east, they drove Christianity almost out of Scotland and almost out of Britain, driving all of Christianity to the west. 
and, and Christianity in Ireland was driven to the west. Everything was driven to the west. And Iona is one of the islands off the coast of Britain where the last pieces of Christianity were maintained. So that once the Norsemen, um, sorry, the Vikings were finally tamed, so to speak, and Saxons tamed, that Christianity could return because they became converted. Okay, and this is just a shot inside that um, place. Uh, this is another island of Ireland. This is called the Arran Isles off the western part of uh, Ireland. Clearly, it's rather like New England. It's one thing that they grow a lot of, and it's stones. Um, it's interesting, too, that you probably are familiar with the, spa, uh, with the uh, Irish um, splitting of the land into the family groups and being a able to maintain plots of land with the help of the potato. And they were able to keep um, people, families in these small plots and survive with their potato fields. This is just an example of uh, the kinds of subdivisions that occurred in Ireland in this period in the early 1800s. Again, another shot of the same kind of thing. Fascinating places that you see. Again, I've been to it. It's quite interesting to look at. These are the little crofts that uh, people lived in. It was lost its top. OK, here's another island. This is uh, a place just to the northwest of Scotland. It's called Faro. It's owned or part of Denmark. And uh, it shows you again the kind of vegetation that you have in cold climates. Nice green areas, lots of rain, lots of stone, and a uh, uh, fascinating looking place. Um, again, look at the <laughs> roofs of these places. They are, have got grass. It's a rather a strange looking place. But I, as I say, I, I thought they would look rather interesting places to look at. Again, the climate is pretty fierce. Um, very cool, probably around 45 to 55, 60, probably max, because the Atlantic is relatively cool. That's another shot showing you what it's like when it's close to raining. <laughs> rather, rather pretty bad, I thought. Um, now I'm going to take you to another island. This island is 200 miles north of the Antarctic Circle. It's called Kerguelen. Kerguelen is called Kerguelen after the fellow who discovered it in 1770, a Frenchman uh, off a ship. Uh, did you have a question? No, oh, you were just waving your hand. Okay. Um, uh, Kerguelen um, is, as I say, an interesting place because when they first discovered it, uh, they <coughs> found that there was a lot of skunk cabbage on it, huge fields of skunk cabbage. Inadvertently, off one of these ships came a few rabbits. Well, guess what happened? The rabbit said, skunk cabbage, man, I'm going to go crazy. So that's what they did. So there was a sudden increase in population of rabbits but a decline in the population of skunk cabbage. Guess what? Once the skunk cabbage was gone, the rabbits had a tough time. There are a few rabbits left, but not many. This is a very harsh climate. The highest temperature is probably around 50 degrees. <coughs> the lowest temperature is probably around 25. Again, very windy very cold, very unpleasant, and not somewhere where anyone would want to settle and have agriculture. So as a result, there are Frenchmen on the island. There are about 50 to 100 research scientists on the island. It's a weather station. Um, but being assigned to Kerguelen is like being self assigned to the Aleutians in the United States. Mm -hmm. It's cold and unpleasant. You said it's north of the Antarctic Circle? Ant the Antarctic. Antarctic. Antarctic Circle. Right. OK, let's show it what it looks like. <laughs> it's pretty nasty. <laughs> Seals. OK, I'm going now to the Falcon Islands. 
The Falkland Islands, you probably know, in 1982, there was this, the Argentinians decided they were going to take the Mal Malvinians. And as a result, Margaret Thatcher saw, no, they're not taking any part of the British Empire. <laughs> and so they proceeded to, to put this incredible armada together and moved down to the South Atlantic. And in the process, spent millions and millions of dollars on this foolish escapade. And the place is really not worth keeping. Its population is very sparse, probably something like 5,000 people tops. And it's probably got more sheep than people, something like 10,000 sheep. And uh, <coughs> it's, um, as you can see, it's not terribly warm and fuzzy. Now, the one interesting thing about Falkland Islands is they have this great and wonderful horse race in the middle of the summer, which is our winter, of course. And the horse race is where everybody comes out and all the women wear their summer frocks. Guess what the temperature is? Between 45 and 50. <laughs> Which only goes to show you, it's amazing what women can adapt to. <laughs> okay. This is the governor's house in, in the Falkland Islands. Again, typical British piece. The governor controls everything in the island, lives high off the hog. Everybody else, bunch of slobs, they, they, they just have to live like normal folk. What I showed here is showing you the kinds of um, architecture that is so British. I mean, you could go to anywhere in the North Country and see the same looking houses. Um, again, why one would want to uh, live there, I do not know. These are the other popular people in the population. They're also a little bit to the west. There are also, it shows you how cool it is, seal, um, penguins. And this is the remnants of, guess what, the war. And of course, if you want to visit the Falcon Islands, you can in luxury, as you can see. Not that I'd want to, but there you are. This gives you a shot of what prevailing winds are like on the Falcon Islands. <laughs> this, is, this is a shot. Okay. Uh, okay, that's Iona. We finished with that. Hang on a second. All right, moving back. Okay, I'm going to go to Canada now. <laughs> okay, here is an interesting place. <coughs> Anybody been across it? Yes. Yeah. It's built in about 19, uh, 1993, yeah. after a lot of contentious arguments back and forth. <coughs> They've been talking about this bridge since 1870. Uh, apparently there was a ferry service, but the ferries yes. were beginning to get a little bit dilapidated. They were going to have to spend a lot of money on ships. And they finally said, gee, I think we might have to bite the bullet here. It was a lot of ship. $1.3 billion to build this highway. Is that the one from New Brunswick, the BEI? This is between yeah. New Brunswick like and BDI. Prince Edward Island. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting story about yeah. Prince Edward yeah. Island, too. The original, yeah. settlers of the original settlers of Prince Island, yeah. Island were uh, French. Uh, when the British finally kicked out the French in Upper Canada, which was uh, Quebec, uh, what they did was they came in to uh, the island of Prince Edward Island, which, which was called Ile Saint-Jean, and they threw them all out. They just literally took them and shipped them out. And you know, all these parts of my British heritage, I find out not in my history books in home, because they never mention the British trying to colonize Haiti. They never mention how we treated other people. And it, it's been a sort of a, an education to me to be so embarrassed to be British, to listen to the things that we did as colonial powers. We were ruthless, like all colonial powers are. Mm -hmm. Any rate, uh, fortunately, there is a small enclave of the French came back to Prince Edward Island, and they're still there. Okay, there's another shot. I thought that's rather magnificent the shot that. Okay, anybody been to Moncton? Okay, what's so special about Moncton? What's this? Anybody? Is that the tidal bore? It's the tidal bore, that's correct. 
there's a tremendous change in the, um, uh, <coughs> by the way, these are people on, on, on the, so I am showing people in my shots here. Um, here they are uh, racing up on their little, what do they call these things here? Um, paddle boards, thank you. Okay, anyway, racing up. Uh, the same kind of thing happens in Britain in the seven, um, in, in, in the West, and they have a title board too. Happens in Nova Scotia too. It does it, okay, True, I didn't know that. Just outside of Truro. Oh yeah? My brother lived there for 20 years. Yes, okay. I, that's where I saw the title oh, board. Oh okay, in Truro. fine. Okay, now I'm gonna talk about these islands. These two islands are the remnants of the French Empire, so to speak, in Canada. These are the two islands called Saint-Pierre and Miquelon, and they are, believe it or not, French. At one point, the French wanted to get rid of them as a colony, and decided in 1990 to say, gee, you know, would you like to be a separate territory, you know, and run, run your own affairs? They said, no thanks. We want to keep hitting the French exchequer. So they're part of a department of France. And this is the water area that the United Nations, they decided in 1995 that there was a dispute between Canada and France. And this is considered the territorial waters of Pierre, Saint Pierre, and Miquelon. Now, it's interesting, too, that this uh, place is rather, oh, this is the tourist shop showing you what it looks like. But this is what it really like. Oh, darn it, I missed it. It's gone. <laughs> I've lost it. Oh, I, I, I must have got rid of it, I'm afraid. Pity, pity. All right. Anyway, here's the story of Saint Pierre Miquelon. It's a very, very cold, uh, unpleasant area. Um, it's got no agriculture. Most of it is fishing. And as a result, because the fishing is gradually declining, it's an area that's uh, rather difficult to keep. Um, going, and so the French have to subsidize this, these two islands quite a lot. Um, it's, uh, it's important in as much as in World War II, the, uh, the free French, uh, remember, were seated in, seated in London. Um, the Vichy French uh, essentially worked with the Germans in southern France. The Germans kept, occupied northern France, Paris, and northern part of France because they wanted to make sure that the British didn't get in. Um, but the southern part of France, they didn't want to control all of it. It was too much of a headache for them. And so they got a puppet by the name of Pétain who ran the show in Vichy France. Uh, so technically, once Vichy France was formed, the islands of Saint-Pierre and Miquelin became part of Vichy France, uh, which meant that they were pro-German which put Canada and the United States in a bit of a bind. So Canada and the United States really were most anxious to make sure that the Germans weren't able to use that area for submarine base. So uh, needless to say, London was not happy about this, uh, but uh, nor was Canada, nor was the United States. So that when uh, General de Gaulle decided that he would get a small group of people to attack this, these two islands and essentially establish themselves on those islands. Um, uh, the uh, person who had gone towards Vichy said, I, I, I'm part of Vichy. They kicked him out. And uh, essentially, the islands would, became part of Free France. And then the threat from the United States, Canada, and Britain was removed, um, the, namely the submarine base. So I thought that was kind of interesting that that happened, and it, it still was relevant to us today. Okay, next, moving on to Newfoundland, which, by the way, I haven't been to. I'd like to go to it, but my wife doesn't like the idea. It's a rather um, hostile kind of country. This is a shot of um, the telegraph uh, office where they sent out telegraph messages uh, along uh, this cable. And I'm going to show you, if you can't read that, I'm going to show it to you a little better. There it is. Um, the first Atlantic Telegraph cable, and you can read it yourself. On August the 5th, 1858, the USS Niagara landed the first Atlantic Telegraph cable at the Bay of Bull's Arm 
near this place. Inaugural messages were exchanged between Queen Victoria and President Buchanan, but shortly thereafter this cable failed. On July the 27th, 1866, what, nearly eight years later, having surmounted great difficulties, an improved cable was laid between Valencia, Ireland, and the Hearts continent, Newfoundland, by the SS Great Eastern. So I thought that was kind of an interesting shot. Here's another place in, in uh, Newfoundland, discovered in as late as 1960. This is uh, Saint, um, Os Meadows, um, which essentially is um, a, 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 essentially a French, um, how can I put it, bastardization of uh, Nordic. And um, this, we believe, is where the Norsemen first settled around 1080. The, this is a barrow, and inside you can go in and you can see um, similar structures were built in Iceland, in Norway, in, in Sweden. And so there's strong evidence to suggest that these uh, places were discovered around, as I say, 1000 AD. Um, there's evidence that they travel south of there because there are buttermint nuts, which you didn't get um, uh, in um, uh, in the, this particular climate. The climate here is extremely harsh. It's the most northern and most tip of Newfoundland. I'd like to see it, but as I said, wife says no way. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, there you go. Just another shot of it. Uh, this is another place, and this is in the United States, but it's right next to Niagara on the Lake, which is part of the United States, uh, part of Canada. Yeah. It's actually, it's called Niagara. It's Fort Niagara, and it's an interesting place, and I've, I've been there, and the reason why I say it's such an interesting place, it was originally held by the French, and uh, that was the fort that the French built, and the British then took it over, and then the Americans took it over. The British held it until 1786. It's hard to realize that, you know, the United States started about 1776, but the British never actually finally withdrew out of the United States until 1786. New York was still part of the British Empire, so to speak, after 1776. They don't talk about that. Um, but, but this is interesting in as much as they had a little ceremony the young kids come, the kids um, from the universities, and they have a little ceremony, and they play this music of the French, and that's, by the way, you can't see it, but there's a fleur-de-lis in there. That's the French flag. Then afterwards, they play a little music of the British, and then they play, needless to say, uh, the uh, Star Stangle Ballad. Star, yeah, yeah. Star, you know what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> it's, you can tell my... British heritage is getting in the way of my American <laughs> naturalization. Um, okay, uh, but it is it is interesting in as much as there were three parts to this kind of part of this uh, uh, location. Okay, this is just another shot of, of, of uh, Lake Louise in, in the eastern uh, western part of the United States, Lake Louise in Canada, okay. my most okay. beautiful place. This water changes color um, depending on the season. And there's only a very brief period when it's like this, it's very blue. Very brief period in the spring when the diatoms are <coughs> in the water, <coughs> allow it to be this color. <coughs> diatoms after that, it becomes gray and rather not very pleasant. Okay, that's Canada done. Okay, let's go back here, see what we got. All right. Next, I'm going to talk a little bit about, well, let's go to the Orient for a change. By the way, I don't know how long we, this show is supposed to last, so you've got to tell me when, you, uh, when it's time, Glenn. You've got, you've got about another 10 minutes. Okay, all right. Where do they bury all the dead on, this, on these rock islands? It's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of water around. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. That's a good question. I don't know how they do it. All right, I'm going, I'm going to go to some, these are some shots that I've actually taken having gone here. This is going to Tibet. 
And this is what it looks like from the aeroplane. Pretty harsh. This is a village which we were traveling by bus. And they said at one point, oh, if there's any way you'd like to stop, you know, say, say so, you know. Well, nobody was saying anything, so I said, I'd like to stop here. They were embarrassed as all hell. They stopped the bus, everybody got out, we walked into this village, and you can see how primitive it was. Incredibly primitive and poor, and it was an embarrassment to the, the guy who was running the show. But they did say, if you want to stop and look, come on. And I did. So I got myself into trouble, as always. Uh, this is a shot showing you the center of one of the streets in um, Tibet. You can see it's a little primitive. The road is not the best. Um, this is a story behind this. I actually got lost in Tibet at one point. A lot came away from the group. And can you could ever imagine going around looking for someone who speaks English in Tibet. It was tough. I can tell you, I was sweating bullets trying to figure out where the hell I was and how I was going to get back to the main group. You couldn't find the Dalai Lama? I couldn't find the Dalai Lama. He's not allowed. He's not there. The Dalai Lama's in India. And this is a shot of the, the school. We went to a school which, of course, needless to say, they were happy to show us because it was all very nice and pretty. This is, of course, a shot of where the Dalai Lama used to live, the Patel Palace. And interesting enough, these, uh, this white part was the, hou the housing of the Dalai Lama. When the Chinese came in, they wanted to show who was boss. So what did they do? They kicked out all the monks out of here. And all the center of the Communist Party is located in the Dalai Lama's premises. This red part is a museum, which we were allowed in. Needless to say, we weren't allowed into the lower part. Now, this is a shot which is an interesting story. This story is a story of how you can get a story from one person, and really the reality is something else. My wife's cousin is a great raconteur. He has a way of talking about a story, and he told me about this story of the Golden Buddha. He said this is the story. In, the Japanese were attacking Thailand at one point, um, Burma, I think it was, yes, Burma, were attacking Burma at one point. And they decided that the Golden Buddha had to be hidden. So they covered it in concrete so that when the Japanese came in, they wouldn't think it was of any value. And they left it alone, and then finally when <coughs> the British and others kicked the Japanese out, then finally they could take the good and Buddha and take the concrete off, and there it was. However, on doing a little research on the golden Buddha, I found the story is entirely different. Nothing to do with the Japanese. It turns out that in 1770, they covered it in a kind of a plaster. For what reason, no one knows. It stayed covered in plaster, this golden Buddha. And they kept putting it, trying to move it. Trying to move it was really difficult because it's several tons. And they finally moved it. And they put it in a shed. And they finally pulled it out of the shed about 1930. And <clears throat> in picking it up with a crane, they banged this stucco, so to speak. And it peeled off, and they went and looked underneath and said, he got its gold. <laughs> so they proceeded to chip all of this stucco off, and in the process discovered <coughs> in the corner was a little key. And they looked at this key, and they found there were certain holes all over this golden Buddha, and they could turn this key and undo nine parts of the golden Buddha. So you could actually disassemble the Golden Buddha and reassemble it later. And so they did that. And they, since that time, they've essentially um, <coughs> resurrected the Golden Buddha. And they put it in the temple. But I thought it was an interesting story. Contrast my raconteur story and the reality story. OK, next. This is a shot of China. I want to show you. Old China 
versus new China. That's old China. This is rapidly disappearing. In fact, I suspect if I went there today, you wouldn't see it. That's ne next door. Here's old China. There's new China. It looks just like part of an American city. This is Hong Kong. This is obviously a fancy restaurant. But there is Hong Kong. The population is enormous. <coughs> The story of Hong Kong is a fascinating one. Again, the British in 1830 conquered China, were wondering whether they should take it over, and decided, having taken India over, and it was a hell of a pain in the neck, that they decided they didn't want China. All they wanted to do was sell them opium, which is what they did. They grew opium in India, sold them opium, got them hooked, and essentially subjugated the Chinese. And the Chinese, needless to say, <coughs> haven't forgiven us yet. But in the process, Hong Kong was ceded to the British for in perpetuity. So, wow, that means we can be like Gibraltar. We can have Hong Kong. However, there was one slight fly in the ointment. As the population kept increasing and increasing rapidly, there wasn't enough water to sustain everybody. But fortunately, the British had managed to gain an area called the Northern Territories, which was a fairly large area where they could get more water. And, however, there was one slight snag, and that was the, the treaty to have the Northern Territories ex expired in, uh, in 1990. So one of the problems, in other words, it was only a 100-year lease, so to speak. So what happened was, the British were deciding, gee, by 1990, the Chinese said, ah, you can't have the Northern Territories anymore. It's ours. So we could have kept Hong Kong, all right, but we wouldn't be able to have them drink water. We'd have to have desalination plants, the whole works. And needless to say, the Chinese wanted the Hong Kong back. But it was interesting. At one point, there was a lot of nasty relationships between the British and, and, and the Chinese in the negotiations. And at one point, the British brought up I think something like two div divisions, about 15,000 troops, on the corner, on the border of China, at, at the northern, uh, at these territories. And the Chinese said, "Look, we can bring a million troops if you like. <laughs> yeah. Is that what you want?" But the British, needless to say, backed down, and that's the story of Hong Kong. Why the British gave up Hong Kong? Because they could not, even though it was in perpetuity, they couldn't keep it drinking. Okay, that's a shot of India, what it looks like. I've been there, that's a shot I took. Teeming with people, one of the most fascinating places you could go to. And um, it just shows you how incredibly messy it is. Um, I just, you know, you see pictures of India, how lovely it looks, and all that jazz. I'm just showing you what India really looks like. <laughs> okay, well, I think that's just about it, right? <coughs> okay. Yes? My question. Yes. <clears throat> when I was in the Air Force, there was a guy from Iceland who was in the service. He was in the military. We didn't touch him. Yes. He was telling me that the fresh water, they strip, if they get their water, they drill holes in Right. Well, I, I'm, not, I'm not so sure about that because uh, I, I would think that that would be an easy way to do it. Yes. Um, it, uh, Iceland is a fascinating place. It's hard to realize that the first republic is established in Iceland in 930 AD. Believe it or not, you know where these two plates were sliding past each other? They established, at that point, a kind of tribal group together, and they decided on a constitution for, the, for Island, uh, Iceland. And at that time, it was no, part of Norway. And later on, it becomes part of Denmark. And then later on, it finally, in World War II, became independent. Yes? Hey, one more. I, the only reason I did some work in Portsmouth, I don't want to tie you up, but Portsmouth, New Hampshire, the downtown, there's a lot of buildings out of 
stone, uh, rough stone that's good for the cap the water. The reason for that is before the revolution, British needed lumber for their ships, but all they had was rock. So this is before the you know, they used to use the ships, used to put the rock in the ballast, come to Portsmouth, sell the rock and buy wood. Trade it off because they needed that wood for their yeah. ships. Yeah. So that's why you put all those buildings in Portsmouth it's all rock. Yes, that's interesting. <laughs> Talking about ballast, you know, when the when the American ships in the 1830s went over to China and Japan and whatever, their ballast, guess what it was? Broken pottery. Broken so they pottery. took they, they took pottery. They took, took huge quantities of pottery. So some, you know, a very beautiful pottery was actually in the ballast of ships coming over to the United States. Are there, are there earthquakes in Iceland? Um, no, not that I know of. But there are incredible motions that go on uh, and, and that produce great, um, how do I say, volcanic eruptions yeah. in the southeastern yeah. part of Iceland. And what's happening is these are producing huge quantities of dust. And it's just possible, are you all familiar with the fact the airplanes were going to shut the airlines yeah. out? Yeah, yeah. yeah. shut the airlines yeah. out. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, one more thing about it. I think it's East Kingston. I, I'm a clown and magician. I was hired to entertain the picture on the 4th of July. So after it's over, when the uh, lady, we were talking about that Portsmouth palace for Brighton right. Stone. Sure. And she says, to me, she says, my house is a whole house. Upstairs, you had it, the floors are planks. It's fine. What happened in Britain needed that wood. So anybody, the Americans, when they cut the trees down, the wide ones had to be sold in England. That was a lot of the king. The small ones they could use for fire with the big one, because they needed that wide boards for their ships. That's right. She said, you know, she said, I don't know, some way back, she's like that with four planks that go three feet wide. It's also uh, important that the British decided they wanted to keep the United States at one point because they needed essentially those tree trunks for the mass of the ship. Yeah. 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 You mentioned about Iceland having a colony back in 1900 and 930 AD. But you also mentioned that was it Newfoundland, the first colony there was around 1000. So no, you're saying uh, yeah, Iceland, yeah. Iceland no, was they were visiting. Earlier. They were essentially that was a sort of a, a uh, um, a way station where they would stay, they would put their ships in, they'd eat, and then they'd travel south. And they'd go back north, and they'd go to Greenland, and then hop, they'd, they'd, they'd hop her over. Okay. That's how they did it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, no, um, that's the, that, it wasn't essentially part of a country. It was just established. Okay. Yes? My daughter law goes to China very often. Yes. Because she buys a lot of the pottery over there to this day that you see around in Home Depot and Lowe's and right. Walmart and all the different places. Right. I mean, part of her job is uh, over there. So wow. she just got back from three weeks over there. Wow. Does she speak any Chinese? <laughs> she speaks like six languages. Wow. wow. By the way, one person, I always remember this teacher told me, his sister dreamt in Chinese. When you dream in Chinese, you really know the language. Can you imagine dreaming in Chinese? All right, end of story. All right.